Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkhoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about my Week 8 wide receiver rankings for the 2024 fantasy football season. Over the course of today's episode, we have a lot to cover. We're going to begin by talking about matchups in regards to which defenses are allowing me the most fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers so that we can identify the most advantageous matchups going into the week. After which, I'll transition into talking about the rest of season strength of schedule at the wide receiver position in order to identify two spectrums of time, Weeks 8 through 14, the remainder of the fantasy football regular season, and Weeks 15 through 17 the fantasy football playoffs in which we're of course trying to take advantage of the overall matchups and potentially trade for these players who have advantageous schedules after which i'll transition then to talking about my top 41 wide receiver rankings for week eight sharing with you guys my thought process and opinions while of course sharing statistics in order to justify these overall rankings if you're looking for my thoughts on a specific player or want to go ahead and immediately travel to the rest of season strength of schedule section travel down to the description of the video of course we have timestamps down there while you're down there if you haven't yet already subscribe click the like button click the no bell notification button because of course we are live streaming every single day on this channel tonight starting around 7 p.m pst i will be live streaming here on the channel so if you have any questions be sure to swing on by also while you're down there in the description before we get into today's content a reminder if you guys haven't checked out underdog at this current moment in time if you sign up using code andrew today and make a first time deposit minimum of ten dollars not only are you going to be able to claim the first time deposit offer potentially tail some of the picks that we've gone ahead and shared over the course of the week yesterday's pick in regards to the nba tip-off already hit but you're going to get my rankings also every single sunday morning for my email directly to yours for the remainder of the season these are by position by tier half ppr full ppr all the encompassing rankings including flex so for those of you interested take advantage of the opportunity by checking out the right side of the screen that map will determine your eligibility based on your current location if you are not eligible or if you've used the code in the past you can also find the rankings via the patreon link also down in the description thank you very much and of course you can go ahead and take advantage of the Wembenyama play tonight if you are a new customer and you sign up today thank you very much okay so let's go ahead and begin by talking about the week eight you know overall conversation of matchups from weeks one through seven, we have found that the Minnesota Vikings on a per game average are allowing the most fantasy points per game based on receiving statistics isolated. That's receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns, leading to 37.8 fantasy points and a half PPR scoring format. So of course, if Cooper Cup is playing tomorrow night against the Minnesota Vikings, we're firing them up because the expectation for majority of the situations are, of course, Wide receivers are going to be in negative game scripts. They're going to have to get themselves a bunch of targets in the second half of the game in order to keep up with the Minnesota Vikings offense, which many teams have had to do over the course of the season thus far. And of course, you know, I'm on rock coming off a pretty solid week. Why not Cooper Cup this upcoming week? But of course, the Baltimore Ravens, Detroit Lions, Jacksonville Jaguars, Buccaneers, Commanders, etc. are the most advantageous matchups. And we will certainly refer back to these statistics over the course of today's episode. Now, some of the more difficult matchups, for example, the Denver Broncos. Today, I will not be mentioning Deontay Johnson outside of this section primarily because you know Bryce Young is going to be the starting quarterback and Patrick Sertan the second has locked down wide receivers Marvin Harrison has a tough matchup against the Miami Dolphins of course Jacoby Myers whether or not he plays we'll have to wait and see but either way he takes on the Chiefs there are very difficult matchups that at times we might want to avoid going into a given week either way now that we've gone ahead and covered week eight matchups let's go ahead and talk about the rest of season strength of schedule at the wide receiver position beginning with the spectrum of time of week eight through 14 the remainder of the fantasy football regular season the Tennessee Titans followed by the Bears, Jaguars, Eagles, Colts, Steelers, etc., have the easiest fantasy football schedules throughout the span of time. We want to potentially get our hands on guys like DJ Moore, potentially Roma Dunze for the second half of the season, potentially elevating to the next level. Jacksonville Jaguars wide receivers, for example, BTJ. Eagles wide receivers, Devontae Smith, who of course had the worst week of his overall career. You might be able to go after him and get him on roster at a far lesser value than you would have in comparison to weeks past. Either way, let's go ahead and talk about some of the more difficult matchups in regards to the rest of the regular season season of the fantasy football year the Raiders at the bottom of this list as long along with the New England Patriots Buffalo Bills Baltimore Ravens and Chiefs of course a lot of the overall matchups for example like the Miami Dolphins sitting at 27 yes they may have a difficult strength of schedule but that does not kind of scare me away from playing guys like Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle now that Tua Tungavailoa is back when elite talent is going up against elite defenses we're going to continue to start the elite talent at the wide receiver position now if we close out the overall rest of season strength of schedule conversation with the fantasy football playoffs weeks 15 through 17 make sure that your commissioners do in fact have a week 17 championship you do not want to be playing a week 18 if in fact teams are going to shut down their players in the final game of the season but of course the Chicago Bears Green Bay Packers New York Giants Las Vegas Raiders Carolina Panthers with the most advantageous schedule throughout those overall periods again the Chicago Bears have three potential shootouts in the final three games of the season in which they may be potentially you know vying for a playoff position against division rivals like the Minnesota Vikings Detroit Lions and of course an NFC rival 
in the Seattle Seahawks. Should be exciting matchups, but either way, just wanted to go ahead and present these statistics along with some of the more difficult matchups throughout this span of time in order to give you guys the indication as to which players you might want to potentially prepare to come ahead and trade for in the coming weeks. With this all covered, let's go ahead and let's talk about my top 41 wide receiver rankings. Beginning with our number one for this week, it is Justin Jefferson who takes on the Los Angeles Rams on Thursday Night Football. Justin Jefferson, in five of the last six games that he has played, he has scored one receiving touchdown minimum. As long as that continues to be the streak of success, he's continuing to get himself a high volume of targets for his overall situation, especially considering the Minnesota Vikings offense is running the ball far more than they did last season throughout this overall span of time course they were far more committed to the past last season because they were in far more negative game scripts in comparison to where they're currently at but either way Justin Jefferson we know is an automatic start he takes on the Rams who just a couple weeks back if you remember weeks one through three for three consecutive games they gave up over 100 receiving yards and a receiving touchdown to Jamison Williams Marvin Harrison Jr and Juwan Jennings and that wasn't too long ago I truly do believe that Justin Jefferson is in line for a huge performance on Thursday Night Football Number two, we have A.J. Brown, who has been playing out of his mind when healthy. In the last three healthy consecutive games, five receptions minimum, 89 receiving yards minimum, and one touchdown minimum per game. Over the course of this season thus far, as long as he's healthy, he's an automatic start, and he continues to get opportunities within the deep ball game, 20 or more yards down the field, which of course he's coming down with all of those receptions. They take on the Bengals this week, which is a middle-of-the-line matchup, averaging nearly 26.56 fantasy points allowed to opposing wide receivers. Most recently, we just saw Tillman go for eight catches, 81. You know, Flowers, seven for 111. Even in that same game, Rashad Bateman, four for 58 in a touchdown. You know, Deontay Johnson, Xavier Leggett, both of them going over 65-plus receiving yards and a receiving touchdown, most recently against the Cincinnati Bengals. The only wide receivers that weren't able to find success were the New York Giants, and that was mainly because of the absence of Malik Neighbors. Either way, A.J. Brown, an automatic start for another consecutive game here. We're just hoping for more targets on a weekly basis, but last week's game, again, a positive game script considering they were leading for majority of the contest. Number three, to close out the S tier, we have Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill's back, I mean, again, with Tua Tagovailoa practicing and expected to be the starting quarterback against the Arizona Cardinals, my anticipation is that Tyreek Hill should get back to a full capacity. The last time we saw Tyreek Hill with a healthy Tua Tagovailoa was back in week one. In that game, Tyreek Hill, 12 targets, 7 receptions, 130 receiving yards, and one receiving touchdown for 22.5 fantasy points and a half PPR. In the last four games, he has only scored 23.4 fantasy points. He nearly outscored that in just one week with Tua in comparison to the last four weeks with whatever quarterback they were throwing at the starting lineup. This week, they take on the Cardinals, which is the seventh best matchup at the position. We just most recently saw a run-first football team in the Los Angeles Chargers throw for 350 passing yards against the secondary. I would anticipate the Miami Dolphins to find a lot of success in this overall matchup in week eight. Number four, to begin the eight tier, we have Amon Ross St. Brown, who again, continues to play well. Four of the last five games in which he has participated in has been able to surpass 17 plus fantasy points and a half PPR. In a full PPR, that's 20 plus fantasy points in each of those contests. So again, as long as he's continuing to put up this high level of production, we have Jamison Williams, who is expected to be suspended for the next two games because of performance enhancing drugs. If this is all going to continue to align, they're taking on the Tennessee Titans, which again, they are 11 plus point favorites against. This should be a one-sided affair, but Amon Ross St. Brown should be able to find himself an abundance of success, mainly because slot receiving options have found success against the Tennessee Titans recently. Slot receiving options, Shakir, 7 for 65. Downs, 7 for 66 and a touchdown, and Jaden Reed, 4 for 50. We all know that Amon Ra is a significantly better receiver than all three of those options and should get himself even more target opportunity because of the disappearance of Sam Laporta and, of course, the potential suspension of Jamison Williams. Number five, we have Drake London, who has himself an incredible matchup taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It was just a couple weeks back that Drake London had himself in week five, 13 targets, 12 receptions, 151 receiving yards, and a receiving touchdown for 27.4 fantasy points against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a Thursday night matchup that went to overtime, and it was an absolute shootout. Kirk Cousins set a career high in terms of passing attempts and passing yards with over 500 in that game. So going against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the fifth best matchup at the position, we are anticipating for Drake London and this offense to continue to pick up where they left off, which is dominating against the secondary. Again, four of the last five games of Drake London's season has consisted of one receiving touchdown minimum. Amongst all players in the league right now, he is number two in terms of red zone targets, only behind Garrett Wilson, and number one in receiving touchdowns within the red zone. We're anticipating continued success within a fantastic matchup for Drake London. Number six, we have Jamar Chase. Look, Jamar Chase, we want him to give more target opportunity. That's another consecutive week in which T. Higgins is out targeting him. 
But either way, was able to get himself in the end zone in a difficult matchup, taking on the Cleveland Browns secondary, who have played very well over the course of the season, despite all of the offensive deficiencies and bad situations they've put themselves in. But either way, they take on the Eagles this week. It is the ninth best matchup. They're allowing nearly 28 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers in a half PPR. With all the implication of this game, based on Vegas' total being one of the highest scoring games of the week, this is a potential shootout in line. And I'm hoping for Jamar Chase to have one of those higher upside performances in which he's able to get himself more than six targets. Those are egregious numbers. We're hoping for more opportunity as we continue. Number seven, we have Stefan Diggs to begin the beat here. Look, Stefan Diggs, in the absence of Nico Collins for the last two consecutive weeks, has played 60 plus percent of his overall snaps out wide in comparison to when he did have Nico Collins in the lineup, was playing the vast majority, about 65 plus percent of his snaps from the slot position. So now that they've transitioned him to playing as the outside receiver, he has an opportunity to take it on the Indianapolis Colts in which he should be able to find himself success. It is the 13th best matchup. They're nearly allowing 27 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. If you go back to week one, against the Indianapolis Colts, regardless of the fact that Stefan Diggs was primarily in the slot position, six catches on six targets, 33 yards and two receiving touchdowns for 18.9 half PPR fantasy points. Even if you go back to week one, Nico Collins in that game, six catches for 117 on eight targets. Regardless of how they want to utilize Stefan Diggs, he'll have a significantly better week than what he put forth against the Green Bay Packers in week seven. Number eight, we have CD Lamb. Look, my only concern is if, in fact, the San Francisco 49ers defense really shows up, they can make it extremely difficult on CeeDee Lamb to find success. I mean, the last time we saw CeeDee Lamb against the Detroit Lions, which is an advantageous matchup, was given 14 targets that only led to seven receptions and 89 receiving yards. Again, still a solid week for half PPR and full PPR purposes, but the last time he took on the San Francisco 49ers, this entire offense got shut down. And I'm worried about another situation here in which it could take place. But hopefully the negative game script is going to lead to double-digit targets more often and for the continuation of the season. If that's not going to take place, we're not going to really expect CeeDee Lamb to reach the overall potential that he was capable of last season. We're just hoping for, of course, this offense coming off of the bye week to be prepared and looking in the direction of the number one wide receiver more often than they have in weeks past. Number nine, we have Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed's ebbs and flows of the season don't really demoralize me to like avoid playing him. I'm going to continue to play him, and I'm not really scared of the ebbs and the flows. I truly do believe that he is a talented wide receiver, and when given opportunity, he is going to be you know, a fantasy force. Now, over the course of the season, he has had himself upside games, and he has had, you know, most recently, last week against Houston, a downside game. Two receptions for 10 receiving yards. But this week, they take on the Jacksonville Jaguars. It is quite literally the best matchup at the quarterback position and the fourth best matchup at the wide receiver position. We have most recently seen... Slot receiving options like, for example, Keenan Allen, 5 for 41 and 2 touchdowns. Josh Downs, 9 catches for 69. Uh, Khalil Shakir, 6 catches for 72 and a touchdown. Stephon Diggs dominated against them. And even though Demario Douglas couldn't put together a you know, great performance because of his illness, even in that second half, KJ Osborne out of the slot position scored a receiving touchdown against the secondary. The Jacksonville Jaguars primarily run man coverage. Jaden Reed should find himself a lot of success within the slot receiving position. Number 10, we have Malik Lambers. Look, the fact of the matter is we know that Malik Neighbors is capable of the upside of 20 plus points per week easily. He has demonstrated that over the course of the season when given ample opportunity. But unfortunately, because of the offensive line issues with the New York Giants last week, Daniel Jones getting sacked seven times. It is an issue in which, of course, Daniel Jones is fighting to stay alive in the pocket while, you know, of course, trying to keep his eyes down the field, which is very difficult to accomplish. Either way, if they're able to double-team TJ Watt for majority of this game, Malik Neighbors should eventually find himself open and be given double-digit targets. And when that does take place, I would expect him to continue to be fantasy relevant. It's just a matter of giving Daniel Jones the proper time he requires in order to get the ball down the field to one of the most talented wide receivers in the league. Number 11. Speaking of this Giants versus Pittsburgh Steelers game, George Pickens played absolutely out of his mind with a quarterback swap. Last week amongst all wide receivers, number two in terms of total air yards, he was able to accomplish nine targets, five catches, 111 receiving yards, and a receiving touchdown against the New York Jets of all defenses. But hey, you give him a capable passing quarterback in the form of Russell Wilson in comparison to what he has had last season and thus far this season. And of course, the upside is going to allow him to finally cook. And that's exactly what he was able to accomplish, even against a monster secondary against Sauce Gardner and the New York Jets. This week, they take on the Giants, which again, wide receivers against the Giants have found themselves in abundance of success. A.J. Brown, Chase, Higgins, Lamb, all of them going over 72 receiving yards in the last couple games here. Of course, A.J. Brown scoring a touchdown in that contest. Same thing with C.D. Lamb. Chase and Higgins not able to score touchdowns with 72 and 77 receiving yards. I'm anticipating a high yardage count at very least and hopefully a touchdown 
within the upcoming contest. Moving on to our number 12, we have T. Higgins. Again, like I mentioned earlier with Jamar Chase, T. Higgins continues to out-target him. That's four consecutive weeks in which T. Higgins has out-targeted him. And this most recent week, of course, coming down with a touchdown again and outscoring Jamar Chase in terms of fantasy point production. Four receptions, 82 in a touchdown. And as long as he continues to face the number two cornerbacks for the remainder of the season, he will continue to find success. They take on the Eagles this week, which of course is the ninth best matchup at the position. We're anticipating continued success for T. Higgins based on the volume of opportunity, the expected shootout between these two teams, and of course, the fact that he's taking on lighter coverage in comparison to Chase, who is pulling double coverage nearly every down. Number 13, we have Cooper Cup. Now, from what we have heard, we know that Jordan Whittington is inactive, and we know that Cooper Cup practiced fully every single day this week. Now, again, it is a short week, so they do not practice in full pads because of the Thursday contest. So it's just an indication that if, in fact, they were going to play a practice in full pads, he would have gone ahead and done so. Either way, we know that there's a lot of rumors regarding Cooper Cup, the potential trade, all that kind of jazz. I would anticipate that, again, if he's going to be active for this game, it's going to be at a full capacity in a negative game script against the best matchup at the wide receiver position. I'm anticipating 10 plus targets minimum. We have seen what Cooper Cup is able to accomplish with a healthy Matthew Stafford in a game in which he is out there without Puka Nakua. We're looking at potentially 15 plus targets on hand as long as this offensive line can keep Matthew Stafford healthy and ready to go. Therefore, if Cooper Cup is active on Thursday, he's in my starting lineup. Number 14, we have DJ Moore. Look, DJ Moore has an opportunity this week to continue where he left off last year against the Washington Commanders secondary. Last season, as a member of the Chicago Bears with Justin Fields at quarterback, in Week 5 Thursday Night Football, many of us remember the glorious game in which DJ Moore had 10 targets, 8 catches, 230 receiving yards, 3 receiving touchdowns, and 45 fantasy points against the Washington Commanders secondary. A, a secondary that thus far this season are the sixth best matchup at the wide receiver position. Therefore, we are anticipating continued success for DJ Moore. This offense is coming off of the bye week. Caleb Williams has continued to improve every single week thus far this season. And of course, we're anticipating for DJ Moore deep down the field to get himself a great volume of overall targets. And even though his targets have fluctuated as of late, I continue to expect him to be the number one receiving option of this team. Despite the last time we saw the Chicago Bears, it was really the Keenan Allen slash, you know, Cole Komet show in that last circumstance against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Number 15, we have the thumbnail of today's episode, it's, it's Jalen Waddle. I mean, look, the fact of the matter is the last time we saw Jalen Waddle play with Tua Tungavailoa was week one. Five targets, five receptions, 109 receiving yards, and 13.7 fantasy points and a half PPR. Again, since then, the last four games of the season, Jalen Waddle's only put up 18.4 fantasy points with whichever quarterbacks they threw at him. Huntley, Tim Boyle, Skylar Thompson, it doesn't matter. What we have seen as of late is not the normal Jalen Waddle. And when we get Tua Tungavailoa back this week against the Arizona Cardinals, the seventh best matchup at the position, a secondary that has struggled mightily this season and just gave up 350 passing yards to the Chargers offense, which of course, again, is not a pass first team. They didn't even have Quentin Johnston available in that game and they still continue to dice up that secondary. My anticipation is immediate success in the return of Tua Tungavailoa for Jalen Waddle. We have number 16, Zay Flowers. I mentioned it last week. I've mentioned it every week. Ever since we have figured out the pattern of Zay Flowers, I have to continue to demonstrate it to you guys so you understand the implied risk. He is 100% dependent on game script. If the Baltimore Ravens are going to come out and immediately take a massive lead of two or three scores or more against an opposing defense, anticipate for Zay Flowers to disappear. In the three games in which they have blown out their opponents, Dallas, Buffalo, and most recently Tampa Bay, prior to, of course, Tampa Bay's fourth quarter efforts. Zay Flowers averaging 2.3 targets per game and 2.93 fantasy points per game. This most recent week obviously got himself a little bit banged up with the ankle. It looked like a hip drop tackle that wasn't called a penalty. And we know that Zay Flowers may not practice later this afternoon. Again, this is being recorded in the morning, so we'll have to wait and see. But either way, in the four competitive games that we have seen Zay Flowers play against Washington, Kansas City, Las Vegas, and Cincinnati, 10.5 targets per game and over 15 fantasy points per game on average and a half PPR. The Ravens, as of this week, are, I think, nine-point favorites against the Cleveland Browns. If this is going to be a blowout, be very careful with Zay Flowers, especially considering he's coming off of the ankle injury. Number 17, we have Garrett Wilson. Look, Garrett Wilson got himself an equal amount of targets as Devontae Adams. The target share being equivalent is a obviously promising thing. Coming off of a week in which, of course, he had himself nine targets, five catches, 61 yards, got himself a two-point conversion, wasn't able to score a touchdown as the offense really did fall apart in that second half with all the turnovers and mistakes. But either way, they're going to improve. It's just a matter of time. They have an opportunity to get right this week against the New England Patriots. Back in week three against the Patriots, we did see 
Garrett Wilson, nine targets, five catches, 33 and a touchdown. And we're hoping that now that he doesn't have to have Christian Gonzalez tailing him for the entirety of that game, and he'll most likely be tailing Devontae Adams, it will open up even more opportunity for Garrett Wilson to be in an advantageous position within the matchup. We have most recently seen wide receivers of the caliber of BTJ go for 589 in a touchdown. Dell, 557 in a touchdown in the same game. Diggs, 6 for 77 in a touchdown. And even Tyree Kill. With Tyler Huntley, a quarterback, six catches for 69 most recently against the New England Patriots. Should be an advantageous matchup this week for Garrett Wilson. Number 18, we have Brian Thomas Jr. who again continues to play well. Now this upcoming week, we are anticipating a negative game script. And every single week for the remainder of the season, unless they are playing against the New England Patriots every week, it should continue to be a negative game script for the Jacksonville Jaguars offense. That means more passing attempts and potentially more opportunities in the direction of Brian Thomas Jr., who, of course, over the course of the last two games, in terms of overall opportunities of targets, has dipped relatively lower than we are comfortable. Five targets is not enough. We need to see him get eight to nine targets every single game minimum, and hopefully that is going to be the case. But again, when you take on the secondary of the Green Bay Packers, do not expect much because mainly... Jair Alexander, when he is active, this secondary is elite. They are forcing turnovers. They are stopping wide receivers. They shut down Tank Dell and Stefan Diggs entirely last week and really forced CJ Stroud to struggle. So if, in fact, you know we throw a guy like Trevor Lawrence into that blender, it could be trouble. But let's just hope that the opportunity is going to be there and his talent is going to be able to kind of surpass the overall coverage that he'll see for the week. Number 19, we have Devontae Adams. Again, taking on the New England Patriots. I do anticipate him to see Christian Gonzalez for the majority of this game, but either way, very similar to Garrett Wilson, got himself nine total targets of opportunity. That is ample opportunity that going forward, once he's able to catch the vast majority of them, he will continue to be fantasy relevant. Again, like I mentioned just moments ago in regards to Garrett Wilson, the New England Patriots most recently have given up five catches for 89 in a touchdown to BTJ, five for 57 in a touchdown to Tank Dell, Six for 77 in a touchdown to Stefan Diggs in that same game. And most recently, even with Tyler Huntley, a quarterback, Tyree Kill still had six catches for 69. I would anticipate that there is a baseline level of opportunity and upside for Devontae Adams in this circumstance to get himself probably six plus catches for 70 plus receiving yards. If he's able to score a touchdown, we're in the overall upside potential of his performance. Number 20, we have Darnell Mooney. Look, Darnell Mooney taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is something that we want to do because we have recently seen him back in week five dominate 16 targets, nine receptions, 105 receiving yards, and two receiving touchdowns for 27 fantasy points, set career highs in a lot of his overall numbers. So considering the fact that the Buccaneers are a top five matchup at the wide receiver position, we have seen wide receivers even just most recently on Monday Night Football, Rashad Bateman go for a huge game. There is a lot of potential for upside. I mean, Lamar Jackson just threw five touchdowns against that secondary. Kirk Cousins could very easily pick up where he left off with Darna Mooney and continue to dominate, even though Darna Mooney has been relatively quiet. For the last two games number 21 we have tanked out who's coming off of a week in which he had zero receptions on four targets a lot of those overall passes thrown into the ground by cj stroud but this week has an opportunity to bounce back against the division rival in the indianapolis colts most recently back in week one Tank Dell taking on the Colts, had himself relatively solid opportunity, had 105 air yards in that week, seven targets leading the three receptions and 40 receiving yards for only 7.4 fantasy points. Of course, had himself 19 rushing yards as well in that game. But in that same game, Nico Collins, six catches on eight targets for 117, was able to take advantage of the deep ball. And that's hopefully where we're going to see Tank Dell live within this week, especially considering they gave him 105 plus yards of air yardage in that game in week one against the Colts. We would anticipate for him to continue to pick up in that overall conversation especially considering in 2023 against the Colts in week two Tank Dell had himself a week of seven catches on 10 targets for 72 and a touchdown nearly 17 fantasy points which hopefully is going to be somewhere of his overall potential within the given week number 22 we have Amari Cooper despite the fact that Amari Cooper only played 35 percent of the offensive snaps in week seven was still able to be fantasy relevant when he ran his overall routes he was targeted 26% of the routes that he ran, which again is an incredibly high number, especially with the first week of participation with this offense. As they continue and he builds a rapport with Josh Allen, it's only going to continue to get better. They take on the Seattle Seahawks, who have struggled mightily against opposing wide receivers as of late. Detroit, 186 and two touchdowns from their wide receivers. The Giants, 158 and two touchdowns. San Francisco, 166 and a touchdown. Atlanta, 132 in a touchdown. Of course, majority of that accomplished by Drake London. But wide receivers finding themselves a lot of success. Are there a lot of mouths to feed within the offense for the Buffalo Bills? Absolutely. But I do anticipate Amari Cooper to find himself as the number one in that overall conversation sooner rather than later. 
Number 23, we have Devontae Smith. Look, Devontae Smith is coming off of quite literally the worst week he could possibly have throughout his entire career. But what we know about Nick Sirianni as a head coach, whenever he has a premier player on his team that does not show up within a given week, it's often the, I'm going to address that and I'm going to get them involved the week after. Whether it was A.J. Brown last season where he had that poor early start to the season and then he had a five-game streak of over 125 receiving yards, monster performances. Even last season, week one, DeAndre Swift, Dallas Goddard, the following week after they weren't given much utilization, had themselves a huge upside of performance. So I'm anticipating Devontae Smith to get himself back into the conversation based on Nick Sirianni and his coaching style within getting his top guys the ball on an often basis. On top of that, Dallas Goddard is expected to potentially miss another week here with a hamstring injury. And considering, yes, this is a difficult matchup against the Cincinnati Bengals nickel cornerback, Mike Hilton, we are still thinking, of course, Devontae Smith will be a lesser option, but still will be given significantly better opportunity than two targets for one reception and negative two receiving yards. Number 24, we have Terry McLaurin. I'd like to warn you all, first and foremost, Terry McLaurin may not have Jaden Daniels and additionally may not have a potential good enough quarterback to take on Jalen Johnson, even though Marcus Mariota and him were able to connect for five receptions and 95 receiving yards last week against the Carolina Panthers because Jalen Johnson, the number one cornerback of the Chicago Bears, not only has he been on a bye week and the rest of his you know, secondary members are going to get healthy and back within the overall lineup, but he has shut down wide receivers like BTJ, 3 for 27 yards, Deontay Johnson, 3 for 23, and Michael Pittman, 4 for 36. We may see Terry McLaurin disappear within the upcoming week, so be very careful whether or not you play him in the upcoming matchup. Number 25, to close out the E tier, we have Romeo Dobbs. Look, Romeo Dobbs, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And once he complained all those weeks ago, he has only been a dominant force since. You know, two weeks back, scored two touchdowns. Most recently, 10 targets, 8 catches, 94 in fantasy football. That is incredible numbers. And now has an opportunity of taking on the fourth best matchup at the wide receiver position as Jordan Love takes on the easiest matchup at the quarterback position. I'm anticipating a lot of success for Romeo Dobbs within the upcoming matchup as the Jacksonville Jaguars are primarily playing man coverage and cannot stop opposing wide receivers. Number 26, we have Chris Olave. Okay, so... Obviously, we know that Rashid Shahid is out for the season. But earlier today, I mean, before I even recorded this video, we had information revealed that Alvin Kamara has been dealing with a broken rib and a broken hand this season. That is exactly what I read within the overall transcript from the overall interview that we saw earlier today. In regards to Alvin Kamara, obviously, he was given a two-year extension yesterday. But my goodness, maybe Alvin Kamara missed his time. And if that's going to take place... Who's going to be the most relevant offensive option? Well, of course, Chris Olave. Coming off of the concussion protocol with Spencer Rattler or whoever is going to be the starting quarterback, it would be a funnel target system towards Olave as there is no one else to potentially rely upon. They take on the Los Angeles Chargers secondary who, are, again, are missing their primary cornerbacks due to injury. We are going to hope that the opportunity share is enough and accurate enough to be able to get Chris Olave within the top 36 conversation. Number 27, we have Ricky Pearsall. So we know that Debo Samuel is dealing with pneumonia. Yesterday, we were given information that Debo Samuel was released from the hospital, but I don't anticipate that Debo Samuel is going to play this week. Therefore, with Debo Samuel pneumonia, Ayuk out for the season, Kittle dealing with a foot injury, and Jennings still dealing with a hip injury, in which Jennings may not play, this is the Wally Pip situation in, in which why I told you guys to go after Ricky Pearsall. He may not be the most talented wide receiver of the group, but he's the healthiest. And when you are given the opportunity to step up against the Dallas Cowboys, primarily playing within the slot position or out wide, it does not matter. When Ricky Pearsall is given the opportunity, if he can take the bull by the horns, he could very easily designate himself as a starter for the remainder of the season based on the next upcoming performances in the absence of Debo Samuel, potentially George Kittle, and potentially Jawan Jennings within the upcoming matchups. I'm anticipating success in a matchup in which, of course, we have seen Brock Purdy find a lot of success in as of late. Number 28, we have Jackson Smith and Jigba. This is under the assumption that DK Metcalf does not play. Again, you have not seen DK Metcalf mentioned within the overall episode, mainly because Earlier today, we were given a designation that he will not practice Wednesday and is not expected to practice Thursday, which again is not a great sign. Dealing with the MCL injury or the sprain is not something that we are taking lightly. Therefore, if DK Metcalf is not going to start this week, Jackson Smith and Jigba would be the number 28. If Metcalf is active, for those of you who have Metcalf on roster, understand that if he's active, you auto start him. That is a given. But the last time we saw JSN without DK Metcalf in the lineup 2023 week seven in that game against the Arizona Cardinals Jackson Smith and Jigba seven targets four catches 63 and a touchdown we're hoping that in a negative game script against the Buffalo Bills a lot of target opportunity will be going in the direction of JSN number 29 
We have Juwan Jennings. Now, like I mentioned just moments ago in regards to Ricky Pearsall, Juwan Jennings is not anticipated to practice on Wednesday. Therefore, if he's not going to practice Wednesday, maybe not even play this week, he's not going to be in this conversation. But I want to go ahead and throw him into this position because we are not anticipating Debo to play. So if Juwan Jennings and Ricky Pearsall are both going to be out there this week, we would anticipate that both of them can find somewhat level of success to at least be a top 30 wide receiver option this week taking on the Cowboys. Again, I have no clue whether or not he does play. By Friday, we'll get an indication. But the last time we saw him play 60 plus percent of the snaps, I mean, he's only done that once this season. In that game, scored 41 fantasy points. Certainly has a great connection with Brock Purdy. And number 30, the second wide receiver of the Seattle Seahawks that I wanted to mention. This overall section has pretty much just been San Francisco and Seattle wide receivers. In the absence of DK Metcalf, we would anticipate Tyler Lockett to get himself more opportunity. Surely, I mean, look, he does get himself a steady stream of targets. Over the course of the last five games, averaging 9.42 fantasy points per game in a half PPR. Pretty solid production. But in the absence of DK Metcalf, we would anticipate that his solid stream of targets would increase enough to where he could still be a top 30 wide receiver option within the given week. Number 31, we have DeAndre Hopkins. So we did get information at 4 a.m. that, in fact, he was traded to the Kansas City Chiefs and is expected to play against the Las Vegas Raiders. In the same vein in which I talked about Amari Cooper last week and where I had Amari Cooper ranked on Sunday morning throughout our live stream, I'll keep the same overall energy. I don't anticipate him to play very many snaps. I don't anticipate him to learn the entire offense. But he will go out there and he'll get himself a couple targets. If he ends up scoring, fantastic. If he doesn't, again, they're playing the Raiders. And honestly, they don't need him to be active for them to win. So we'll have to wait and see. But again, this is a huge uptick for the potential of Pat Mahomes. And hopefully DeAndre Hopkins still has some gas left in the tank as he used to be an elite wide receiver and now has an opportunity of playing with the best quarterback he has ever played with in his career. Number 32. We have Marvin Harrison Jr. Taking on the second toughest matchup at the wide receiver position is not fun. Marvin Harrison Jr. has really just become like a glorified version of Jamison Williams. He needs a deep target down the field that leads to a touchdown for him to be fantasy relevant. And unlike Jamison Williams, he does not get opportunity. So in this overall conversation, Marvin Harrison is a very difficult start. You might want to leave him on the bench until he can prove that he can be a consistent option on a week in and week out basis. Until then, it is very difficult to start him, especially in a tough matchup where we have seen the Arizona Cardinals offensively struggle multiple times outside of the running game. Number 33, we have Jalen McMillan. Another one of these wide receivers that we may have picked up yesterday over waiver wire has an opportunity of the most valuable metric in fantasy football, which is target opportunity. With Evans and Godwin out this week, he should be the number one receiving option of this offense outside of potentially K. Dotton or one of the running backs, specifically Rashad White, within the receiving game. The last time they took on of course, the Falcons in week five, it was a shootout that went to overtime. In that game, Baker Mayfield, 180 passing yards, 19 to 24 passing, and three passing touchdowns. We'd hope that Jalen McMillan is up for the task on hand and is given enough opportunity to deliver a solid fantasy performance. Number 34, we have Demario Douglas. Look, Demario Douglas only played one snap in the second half of that game, but I do anticipate outside of Hunter Henry, he is the next most relevant option within this offense, especially taking on the Jets, whose secondary is a little bit beat up as of late. If Michael Carter is going to potentially miss this upcoming week, it's going to open up even more opportunity for Demario Douglas to find success. Even in his absence last week, KJ Osborne scored a touchdown within the slot receiving position. So hopefully, the illness is behind him. The London game is behind him. And he continues on the success that he found back in week three against the New York Jets, in which he had nine targets, seven catches, 69 yards, and 11.3 fantasy points with Jacoby Brissett. Now he has an even better potential because of the quarterback play of Drake May. Number 35, we have Khalil Shakir taking on the Seahawks. Again, the Seahawks nickel cornerback has allowed the eighth most targets, sixth most receptions, and eighth most receiving yards to opposing slot receiving options. Therefore, Khalil Shakir, who can arguably be considered the number one receiving option of Josh Allen, or at least, at very least, his favorite receiving option and target of the offense, should be able to continue to find success coming off of a week that now he finally looks healthy of seven targets for 65, which hopefully can continue to be there and maybe find himself an upside with a touchdown. 36, we have Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman has finished as a top 40 wide receiver in four of the last five games. He has quickly become Jamison Williams. He is the like number two, number three receiving option of a top tier offense in the National Football League and is making plays that score touchdowns and deep receiving yards down the field. And that is all that we care about. As long as that is the case and he continues to score in a favorable matchup against the Cleveland Browns, we're going to hope that he can continue to find success on a consecutive weekly basis, coming off of a week of four catches for 121 and a touchdown. 
37, we have Cortland Sutton. This should be a very easy matchup, but they don't really require Cortland Sutton to have to find success in order for them to win. Mainly because, I mean, just looking at last week, he had zero targets, mainly because obviously Marshawn Lattimore gives, you know, opposing outside wide receivers a lot of struggles. Mike Evans, for example, Cortland Sutton didn't see a single target, but not only that, but like the Saints last week, they can't stop the run. And this week, neither can the Carolina Panthers. But if given opportunity, that is ample. Cortland Sutton in weeks three, four, and six, most recently has put up 10 plus fantasy points in each of those three games and a half PPR. So he certainly can be of value, especially taking on a Panthers secondary that cannot stop a soul and have Bryce Young at quarterback this week. Number 38 is Michael Pittman Jr. The entire conversation of the Colts offense revolves around whether or not Anthony Richardson can get the job done. Thus far this season, he has had a 50% passing completion percentage or lower in every single healthy game. And Shane Steichen has come out after the game and said, it's on me. I got to get these wide receivers open. Therefore, that so Anthony Richardson can complete these passes. But I mean, really, Flacco comes in and Michael Pittman Jr. is averaging 12 and a half fantasy points per game. Anthony Richardson comes in and Pittman's averaging 5.53 fantasy points per game. It's the quarterback, purely. Luckily, they play against the Houston Texans, who, of course, Anthony Richardson has familiarity against. He played relatively well in week one against, relatively well. Nine completions, not a great overall week, but we have seen wide receivers recently, just in the last couple games, Douglas and Boot, both scoring a touchdown against that secondary as a member of the New England Patriots offense. And of course, last week, Wicks with a touchdown and Dobbs with eight catches for 97. Hopefully, Michael Pittman Jr. can have some sort of relevance within the week. Number 39 is Jordan Addison. The fact of the matter is Jordan Addison is pretty much just guaranteed three receptions per game. If Hawkinson is to play this week, that makes it a little bit less of an option for Addison. But as the opposite side of Jefferson, he should be given ample opportunity against the lesser cornerback, which hopefully would lead to his overall fantasy success in a game in which they should be dominating for majority of the, you know, the overall contest against that Ram secondary. Number 40 is Wando Robinson. In a full PPR, he should be highly ranked in comparison to where he is in this half PPR circumstance, mainly because the receptions that he is getting is at an all-time high. Again, he's continuing to get himself five-plus receptions on a consistent basis with ample opportunity. So the receptions in a PPR will carry him. In a half PPR, a lesser option, even though it is a pretty solid matchup against the nickel cornerback of the Pittsburgh Steelers defense, I would still anticipate that his average depth of target is not high enough to justify him being higher than number 40 and a half PPR. And our final option is our number 41, Xavier Worthy. While DeAndre Hopkins is on the other side of the field potentially pulling coverage, hopefully Xavier Worthy, like he has done thus far this season, scoring 10 plus points 50% of the time, could find himself with a potential reception down the field in which maybe he's either able to get the yardage or potentially a touchdown. They give him a couple rushing attempts a game. He could also score in that regard, just like Michael Hardman was able to accomplish last week. Either way, he's pretty much the 50-50 player. Last week, amongst all players in the league, he was number three in terms of total air yards, 134. If you give him the opportunities down the field, eventually it is going to break. You either have two options. You either be patient with it and hope that he hits eventually, or you just leave him on the bench and just live with the overall circumstance. All right, that's going to cover it in regards to my top 41 wide receiver rankings, the you know wide receiver strength of schedule for the remainder of the season, and of course, the week eight matchups. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with some potential entries via underdog for, of course, the Thursday night matchup and our quarterback and tight end rankings for week eight. I'll be live streaming later tonight starting at 7 p.m. PST. So if you have any questions, be sure to swing on by. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace.